Hey everybody, welcome to our early comics review video. I'm Andy. I'm Matt. We're here with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this is our longer show where we show you some of the biggest and best books that you can get this week in your local comic book store. Yes, starting this week, you can get any of these amazing books mm -hmm. you see before you, whether you shop here at the store, Infinity Flux, or you go online, shop infinityflux.net, or if you have your own local comic book shop, we are here to tell you about these books. We don't care where you shop as yep. long as you're reading comics. That is the most important thing and that you're enjoying them. Definitely. Don't read them sure. if you don't enjoy them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, we've got some really good books this week. I'm really excited to see some uh, number twos of things that we really enjoyed the number ones of. Mm -hmm. we got some number ones of things that I was excited to read. So let's get into it. Yeah, so we're going to start with a number 13, which we don't normally do. Oh, but I love good issue number 13. I 13s. know, right? But um, this is actually part two of the House of Brainiac story. So this is Superman number 13 right here, House of Brainiac part two. And uh, still written by uh, Joshua Williamson with art by Rafa Sandoval, who was the same team on Action Comics number 1064 last week. So even though it's a different title, it feels very cohesive. Yeah. Um, and it's great. If you like the first one, you're definitely going to like this one. Uh, in this one, Superman tracks down Lobo. We finally see Lobo uh, to get his help finding out where Brainiac is. Now, that's a little confusing because the backup story in Green Lantern number 10... I was going to ask about that. Yeah, it has Guy Gardner going to find Lobo. So I'm thinking that maybe like that backup story that's going to be in issues 10, 11, and 12 of Green Lantern, maybe that takes place before this. Yeah. Um, because on this Lobo's already on Earth, so a little bit of a out of out of a, out of continuity stuff there. Um, but there's some great Superman and Lobo moments. Of course, they have to throw down a little bit when yeah. they first meet up again. Uh, most of the issue, however, takes place on Brainiac's ship. Uh, we see him running experiments on the various members of the Super Family and the super-powered friends of the Super Family uh, that he kidnapped last issue. Uh, we learned that he does plan to use their powers for his experiment. His main goal, and this isn't a spoiler because this has been in the solicitations. This is what the story is about, and it's part of what the Absolute Power event is going to be about mm -hmm. later this summer. But we know that Brainiac wants to create or clone or build, whatever you want to call it, a, a Queen Brainiac. Yeah. We don't quite get a look at Queen Brainiac yet, but we do know that he wants to create her he is going to use the powers of the various super people to achieve that goal but maybe there's a little bit something wrong with him too maybe he's not quite as perfect as as he's as he's putting on uh lex luther figures into that a little bit too but we still don't quite know you know we learned last issue that or last part that lex knows more about all of this than he's letting on he's not directly responsible for it but he's got some knowledge in his head about the who's and the what's and the why's of all of it and he's not being very forthcoming with it so just another great part of the House of Brainiac storyline. Uh, we, we do get a little bit of... It's, it's cool because um, there's a, a big Green Lantern tie into this too because Superman and Lobo have to go out into space. Mm -hmm. But they mention, well, how are you going to get past the United Planets quarantine, which has been talked about a lot in Green Lantern. So it's it's really nice and cohesive with a couple other books as well. But it, if you haven't read Green Lantern, don't worry. It's it, This is still its own thing. So Yeah, uh, and to see how they get past it, Superman and Lobo. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it was just another really cool moment where you see something like that. That's an action figure right there. Oh, for sure. And especially with a... it's it, And it's done in a nice two-page yeah. spread. It's fantastic. The first part was great. It's still full of fun. It's fun. It's action-packed. Great art. Everything about it, I recommend and, highly. And Lobo and Superman have such great like back and forth because clearly these two have known each other for a very yeah. long time. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, here's another meeting between us. But to Lobo, this seems a little bit more intense for Superman than ever yeah. before. And it's really interesting to see how their dynamic plays off in this story. Because now, Brainiac's messed with Superman's family. And it, right. it's personal. Yeah. For sure. So another great part of House of Brainiac. I can't. The next one that we're going to get is the House of Brainiac special that comes out either next week or the week after. I can't quite remember. And that's going to be sort of a part two point five. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn a lot more about Brainiac and his plans and all that stuff uh, then. So I'm completely on board. I love this so much. So uh, we're going to show you the A cover again right there. And then we've got some really cool variants for this. <laughs> we've got. Uh, we've seen a few of these so far. This is the. Um, 
the uh, uh, Maria Wolf and Mike Spicer, the April yep. variants, which are always really fun. We've got this really nice Libra Mayho, um, Superman and Lois variant right there. And then we wanted to let you know that we got back in stock some more of Action Comics number 1064, which is House of Brainiac Part 1. So if you missed on getting it the first time, we do have some more of these now. And it's a really cool connecting cover with Part 2. It looks yes. super good right there. Um, so yeah, uh, if you want, order Part 1 and Part 2. They'll both come in at the same time or come in store and pick them up and you'll have a really good, a really good story right there. Yeah, I love the story too because it feels like... We know what's going on, but there's still so much mystery. Yeah. And we even know kind of where it's going to end up with Absolute Power, at least kind of how it's going to look. Yeah. But there's so much more that's going to mm -hmm. be going on in this that I'm really excited to read about. Plus, uh, this makes me love Lobo. This makes me want a Lobo series yeah. now. Like, it's it's great. It's, it's great all around. Okay, so next up for me, another big one this week, Ultimate Black Panther number three. This is the one we've been waiting for. We've got Storm and Killmonger on the cover. Uh, so this picks up after the last one where I didn't, it wasn't just kind of like a, a cold ending with Black Panther looking up at Storm and Killmonger. Yeah. And we're like, oh no, what's going to happen? This takes place, it feels like a few weeks later. Yeah, it's they, uh, Shuri, I think, mentions that he's been gone for a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So it, the Black Panther has not been seen. Shuri kind of knows where he went because she she's the one who kind of discussed with him before about hey, there's like these kind of rebels working out there yeah. that you need to go check out. Okoye, uh, even though she's the queen, is not necessarily privy to this information, and maybe there's a little bit of tension between those two about what information should or should not be uh, revealed. Uh, so that's an interesting part, but the main part, we have Black Panther with Killmonger, mm -hmm. and it just seems like he's been kind of, I don't know, learning from him, but just like spending time with Killmonger out of the uh, the futuristic city of Wakanda. Yeah, kind of outside of the Wakandan bubble, like T'Challa, it seems like his whole life has been all about Wakanda in yeah. this bubble, and now Killmonger is basically saying, there's more outside of Wakanda then you know we're going to open your eyes to some of that yeah stuff. yeah maybe it's not because even Killmonger talks about like I'm from Wakanda but I never want to go back because right. you know I'm needed out here so a lot of it's about that and and maybe T'Challa realizing his place as a hero to more than just yeah. Wakanda but uh it seems like he's kind of earned Killmonger's trust and Killmonger has maybe some secrets of the Wakandan area of his whole land that T'Challa didn't know anything about. That's another kind of relevatory thing to Black Panthers that like, maybe I don't know everything I think I know. Right. And this is where, I don't want to give away too much about it. They go somewhere. Very mysterious. That's where Storm is. Uh, and from what, it, you kind of have to do some deciphering. You have to, you know move some red strings in your in your brain uh, that may or may not be correct. But it seems like maybe this has something to do with the bigger Ultimate Universe. Uh, at least maybe it's going to explain more about what Ra and Khonshu are up to. Yeah. What they're... Because I think Killmonger even says, like, let me tell you about what they're actually after, uh, which is interesting. And it's kind of an ending that's just like whoa what is this yeah like, what am i looking at and yeah. how is it going to play a factor into the larger story yeah, yeah but it does feel pretty the the gravitas of mm -hmm. it feels pretty big um so i'm interested to see once people read this what people's theories are behind it because i do think all of the ultimate books are going to probably within their first six issues maybe start hitting upon some of the bigger Ultimate Universe stuff. We see them kind of veering towards there, even Ultimate Spider-Man, yeah. except for Kingpin and who he's working for and and uh, Bullseye and Spider-Man. And we'll have to see, but I think this is a very interesting addition to the overall tapestry of this Ultimate Universe. And I'm looking forward to, especially the next issue. I feel like the next issue is going to have like maybe, you know, Black Panther may start asking the questions we're asking. You're right, right, right. I think right, that's right. going to be yeah. super cool. So just another really interesting entry. Uh, this is, I think we talked about it, uh, a little bit more decompressed storytelling. Yeah, there's not 
there's not really any action in this book. Yeah, we'll, we'll say that. There's action, but it's not not in the way not you the think. way you'd think. Yeah. So, uh, but I feel like this is you know you're along for the journey yeah. in this of learning everything. So very interesting issue. We've got a few variant covers. So we have this really nice boss logic variant, and I don't, I still don't know who that character is. Which character? Oh, yeah. That looks like a Moon Knighted version of Black Panther, kind yeah, of. Yeah, so very interesting one there. Huh. We've got this Kasara variant. Is that one you just showed? Is that one of those foreshadowing variants? I don't think so. I, think I just wonder because of something that uh, one of the solicitations said about Black Panther powering up or something. Hmm. Also kind of looks like Killmonger with his mask on. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, it could be, yeah. Uh, we also have this 125 scan variant we're selling for $24.99. And it's really cool. Uh, Peach Momoko design variant. It's interesting, Peach Momoko doing designs for other books yeah. for Ultimate Storm, but that could show some of the tie between Ultimate X-Men and Ultimate Black Panther. Maybe, you know, if we get Storm in Ultimate X-Men, even if... It's a flashback, or if it's a, on TV or something, you know, that's what she's going to look like. Yeah. Well, next we're going to talk about Cobra Commander number four. This is the next to last issue in this awesome, awesome Cobra Commander so. miniseries. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're going to get Destro and Scarlet after this. So, um, but in this one, uh, you know, we learned, we saw last issue Nemesis Enforcer is the one who's been, uh, you know, palling around with Cobra Commander and he revealed himself last issue. Well, in this issue, he takes out most of the Dreadnoughts and that's not a spoiler because that's not really a large part of the story. Right. But while he's doing all that, Cobra Commander finds a scientist that's actually locked in a bunker. The Dreadnoughts sort of forced him down into a bunker and, and have made him work with Energon, which is what Cobra Command is after. Um... This scientist, and I don't think he's anybody that we know from G.I. Joe lore. I don't I think, think so. Um, but he shows Cobra Commander that he has figured out a way to combine Energon with other forms of radiation to make an energy source that isn't pure Energon, but it still works. Um, and Cobra Commander is very interested <laughs> in this. And through that, we get another small transformers connection that's that's more than just energy on it's Not, more than just meets the eye <laughs> yeah right uh it's nothing major uh it's not it's nothing major but there is a little bit of a transformers connection there uh and cobra commander is like super excited oh we've got to get you know he he goes and tells uh nemesis enforcer we've got to get this guy back to cobra law he has a lot of information that is super useful to us um and maybe nemesis enforcer has different ideas for that um, what we also learn is who the Dreadnoughts have been selling their weapons to, mm -hmm. which we will see more of in a another mini series. If that maybe gives you a little yeah. bit of a hint, but um, it's all very cool. Uh, I've been loving this so far, and this issue, like everything's coming to a head. I don't really know how it's going to end. There was some cool stuff in this too, like Cobra Commander does a couple cool things yeah. in this that I'm excited to see that. Uh, you know, maybe they'll revisit that in the next issue or another mini series. Like, there's, there's, there's gonna be more to that. This can't be the only time we see that. And, so, you know, I was gonna, I was interested in this mini series to see how does Cobra Commander go from where he started in this to the Cobra Commander we know. Right. And I mean, you see that happening. Even like how he's going to decide to set up his own yeah. thing. Right. Uh, yeah. And maybe not work for anybody else but himself. Yep. And all of this is just like a really cool like. And it feels really natural. Mm -hmm. Like he's so smart, yeah, uh, and and so good, like tactically and everything. Uh, you know, he sees the people that will benefit him, and he wants to keep around. And then he takes out the people he doesn't want. Right. It's very very cool. Uh, and I think you know by the next issue, he's gonna be almost there to the Cobra Commander. Yeah. That's like well on his way. Well yeah. on his way mm -hmm. to being the leader of that organization. Yeah. So, fantastic issue. We wanted to go ahead and put it near the top of the show because everybody loves this. It always sells out, so we want to let you know that it's out this week. So, there is our A cover right there, and we've got some cool variants. This is the uh, Bresson and Lucas variant Which, with some, lots of Energon there. I believe that's your artist on another upcoming that's right. Energon Universe title. Yep. Here's our 1 in 10 Chris Burnham variant that we're selling for $10. I think that's a connecting as well, I yeah. believe. 
Um, here's our 1 in 25 Tar and Clark variant that we're selling for $25, featuring Mr. Enforcer himself. And then a 1 in 50 Oliver variant that we're selling for $45. Wait a minute. Who's hand? Oh, yeah. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so interested, especially with this being the Energon universe. Once Cobra Commander really gets his hands on some Energon, I want to see what he creates. Yeah, it's, it's going to open they, up a whole new yeah. world of fun. Yeah, probably <laughs> a lot of snakes. Right. Okay, so and next up I have a new number one from Boom Studios. This is by Zach Thompson and Nicola Izo, and it's called Blow Away. Not blown away, like I keep wanting to say, blow away. So I remember do, uh, going over the solicitation for this. I think it sounded really interesting, uh, but I had a lot of questions about it. And reading this, super cool. Uh, so uh, in Baffin uh, is a island in Canada. And we have our character Bryn, who is a wildlife photographer. And she's very much like, you know, almost like I want to get, I want to be like that photographer that gets something huge. Um, and one of the things she's out there for, she's kind of on assignment, like just get like nature pictures, get pictures of the mountains, all of that. And this is like an area no one goes to. Like this is, you know, pretty dangerous with the, the snow and the cold and everything. She's got a base there, but she knows that there's a possibility that a, uh, type of bird that is thought to be extinct just a, a like a type of cardinal or something uh, may she has a feeling that's there and like if I could photograph this and prove that they're not extinct like I'm gonna be on the magazines yeah. I'm gonna be all this kind of thing so she's up there and she's got her camera set up it's not like she goes out there and just like waits for a bird she's got like the automated one set mm -hmm. up and she goes she gets the memory cards out and goes back to her base and goes through the pictures or whatever um, and she captures a few things. So she captures a very interestingly, a hunter she sees over the course of a few days, uh, who at one point, like you, you see like grids of the pictures. And so you kind of get a narrative of that. And he ends up shooting one of her cameras. She's like, well, that's what a jerk. Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to take nature. Like pictures. on purpose. Yeah, like, okay. you see him, like, turn, and then the next one is, like, nothing. Oh, okay. Um, and she's just basically like, oh, that guy's a jerk. Like, I'm just trying to take pictures and, yeah. you know, doesn't want me doing not, that. Not cool, bro. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't seem, like, super uh, evil of him to do. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's just, like, we don't want you here type thing. Uh, she also, like, photographs um, a polar bear. Because at one point, she's out there, and a polar bear gets caught in a trap, and she helps to let it free and then later she sees that polar bear and thinks so that's really oh, yeah. cool like but she's super super bored until she spies two climbers and she's like it's a little weird i'm watching them they don't know i'm here but over the course of days she watches them climb this mountain and she kind of dubs one red and one blue because of what they're wearing uh everything's going fine until they make it to the summit and in her pictures it looks like they get in a, a kind of a fight and one pushes the other one off the mountain, but there's a big snow drift that comes by in the next pictures. You can't see anything. And so she's super worried about this, but uh, she thinks like, did I just take a picture of someone getting murdered? So she goes on an investigation, but it seems like some of these elements that maybe she's been taking pictures of before, is it all connected? Is mm -hmm. there... Is this all a bigger conspiracy type thing? It's really cool. I described to you before we started filming is it feels like an indie game. Like if you like, I could see this as like, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of extra characters, but there's these elements that are like, how are all these connected? So if you like that kind of mystery, um, you know, it's not horror, but it's definitely like thriller yeah. uh, level stuff. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but in a very like refined way. So I highly recommend it. If that's the kind of thing that you like. So that is the kind of thing I like. Yeah. Um, very different tone. So I strongly suggest Blow Away. This is our first issue. I'm not sure how many issues it's going to be. But uh, it seems like, you know, a good like one and done miniseries. Yeah. It doesn't seem yeah. like it, it could go any further than this and that's okay. So we've got our boss variant. You can kind of see that's like the landscape. It's just desolate. Very cool. 
Uh, we've got a virgin version of the boss cover. And we have a 1 in 10 woo variant. Who are selling for $8 of the A cover. All right, well, next for me is a new number one called Silicon Bandits. And this is the second book from Magma Comics, which is a new publisher. Uh, the first one was Principles of Necromancy that we talked about last week, and it was really good. And this one was cool, too. So this one is written by Jason Barr. The art is by Dalbor Talogic. Um, this is set in 2089. So this is a sci-fi, like, futuristic book. Um, there, it's, it's about a married couple named Aurora Withers and Kenji Sato. They're a husband and wife team, and they work for this really large corporation. Um, and it, it does a little bit of world building because it says something about, um, you, you know, something happened hasn't happened since the Fifth World War. Mm. And I think the United States has been disbanded, and they keep mentioning quadrants. So I'm not sure if the United States have been divvied up into, like, sections of four or something. And maybe each one is run by this, like, giant mega corporation. But they work for this giant mega corporation. Um, I, don't, I just don't know quite its place in the overall country. But um, but they design androids. These this married couple they design androids for this large company. And androids in this world are part of everyday life at this point, helping out with household tasks and things like that. Everybody has one, that kind of thing. So um, this couple they have designed prototypes of the next model, kind of like, you know, everybody's got an iPhone like eight or whatever. And then, you know, they designed the next, you know, I, the next iPhone basically, but they designed the next model of Android, which is much, much more technologically advanced than every, any Android that have come before it. Um, well, and they did a great job, right? Like the Androids are smart. They're aware they can think they can learn and that kind of thing. Uh, these ones that they designed, I mean, and now that they've created these androids, uh, the CEO of the company they work for, his name is Ethan, not Ethan, but Ethan Crane. He doesn't see a need for these for for this couple anymore. He's like, you've done your job. Uh, now that the now that you've given me these super smart androids, I'm going to use those androids to make more androids and to continue to upgrade and and create new mm -hmm. models of androids. You are of no more use to me. You guys are fired. Get out, basically. And, I mean, obviously they're not happy about this. So Aurora kind of worries about what she and Kenji are going to do now that they've lost their job. Um, but Kenji reveals to her that he's actually been working on something in secret for the last year that will ensure they never need to work again. And that's where I'll leave it right there. But uh, he's, yeah, he's he's kind of got a little bit of a plan and maybe it involves the use of some androids mm. because they are really good at working <laughs> with androids. So uh, just a really cool sci-fi. It's, like it's not like a horror book or anything like that. Just kind of a, you know, kind of a, um, not even a really a mystery, but just sort of a, a sci-fi book involving all kinds of, you know, it's kind of Blade Runner-esque mm. a little bit, but not so, not quite so desolate, post-apocalyptic. But it's just really cool. Like I want to see what happens next because of the solicitations. We know that maybe his plan doesn't quite work out the way he intends and that kind of thing. So I'm interested in seeing that come to fruition. But yeah, a really good book, a good new book from a new publisher. I, I recommend it if you're looking for something new to read. So that is Silicon Bennett's. That's our A cover right there. We've got a couple cool variants. This one is from uh, Goran Parlov, and that's your married couple right there that work with these androids. And then we have this really cool uh, Mike Diodato variant. It's a one in one in five, and we are selling it for fifteen dollars. So Magma is kind of two for two. Yeah. With uh, with with their books so far, yeah, yeah they're, they're the both been really good. book, and then this one, so mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah. Okay, next up, I've got one that I've been eagerly anticipating. This is Spectacular Spider-Man number two. Uh, so we love the first issue of Spectacular Loved Spider Man. It. It's just the kind of Spider-Man book we've wanted for a long time. You know, with this and Ultimate Spider-Man, I feel like we've got some really good Spider-Man mm -hmm. in our lives now. Yep. Uh, so in this one, well, the previous one we got, you know, we've got Miles and Peter who are trying to um, not like build a friendship. They're friends and everything, but kind of build a more regular rapport with each other yeah kind of like uh, grow their friendship outside of just being spider-man kind of yeah. like they're trying to go from being work friends to real friends you yeah know? so uh, we've got great <laughs> stuff even in that uh, web of spider-man issue where they're really trying to become regulars at a college yeah, that it's was really great like b plot yeah that is like really touched on but i don't know it just really helps the overall story 
So they're still meeting about all of this and everything, uh, trying to figure out about their previous run-in with uh, the Jackal and the previous issue, all of that. But just like in the first issue, we're also getting some weird, like one or two page stories of people that seem unrelated, mm -hmm. uh, just something completely different. But those are starting to, you know, one kind of starts creeping into the main story. So we have a guy who, uh, we kind of catch him with this girl that he really likes. And he's like, no, but your boyfriend. And she's like, I talked to him and he understands we really love each other. And he's like, well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, but apparently she works at this coffee shop. And when this guy goes in to be like, hey, or whatever, uh, her boyfriend's there. It's like, what are you doing? Hit on my girlfriend. And she's like, I never said any yeah. of that stuff. So it seemed like maybe that was his biggest fantasy, but uh, something's a little off with that. Um, that kind of leads to one thing after another. Um, because this was such a weird scenario, Peter and Miles follow this guy because he starts talking about some weird place. I kind of don't want to say what it is because yeah, it I mean, might give away a little bit too right. much. But that does lead them into quite the adventure, uh, leading them to the sewer. They face off against the vermin, which is always really fun. But this is a really interesting uh, issue and building this bigger mystery about like what is who's behind all of this? How are all these stories related? Um, there's some great cameos in this. They're still trying yeah. to figure out. Uh, there was a a strange like burned victim in the previous issue that they go to a very familiar doctor to work out and some more mystery is behind that when they realize that maybe this person didn't burn, but they kind of exploded internally yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a really weird way. Um, we get cameos by another hero that's really cool. It's a really fun issue, and I really like that it balances like the friendship of Peter and Miles with a pretty compelling mystery uh, that feels like a larger scope story. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because, like, that's you know, this is a it's a fun book, it's action packed, but there is a mystery mm -hmm. that they are there is a story they're setting up. There is a mystery that uh, Peter and Miles are trying to solve, although maybe they don't realize it yeah. just yet. But we know that this is a mystery book as well, and there's there's weird things going on, but it's all going to come connect together when it's all said and done. And it's cool to sort of speculate and try to figure out what is the mystery of yeah. all this. Yeah, we've got our ideas, especially kind of the names of certain things. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, okay, that might be related to somebody. But uh, I also just love at the core of this, it is about Peter and Miles. Yeah. And their relationship. And they're learning from each other. You know, Peter's not too old to learn from Miles, who's younger. And Miles is definitely learning a lot about what it means to be a hero. Yeah from peter so just overall fantastic book and it's what i like best is like it's peter and miles without all their baggage from their other books like you know uh in miles book he's dealing with all this ptsd and stuff and his uh uncertainty of being a hero none of that's in here and peter with all of his problems in amazing spider-man none of that's in here as well it's just pure it feels very classic yeah it's just pure unfiltered spider-man and that's what i really like i would say i don't know if we said this about the first one if you're a fan of the spider-man and spider-man 2 games yeah man is there not a better book yeah to follow into because you get that feels like the template of this where the relationship is equals yeah. And you see how they work separately, but together. Yeah. So, yeah, just read this one. It's fantastic. Spectacular Spider-Man number two. Great Humberto Ramos art mm -hmm. that I just can't get enough of. Got some great variants. So we got this great homage cover by McCone, of course, of your first Morbius appearance. Yeah. And I like that that suit on Peter. Like, hey, maybe yeah. we can see that in an issue sometime. Yeah, very cool. It's really cool. We've also got this, another homage cover. This is the Sliny variant, yeah. which I believe is a Hulk 181. I think so. Uh, yeah. Homage. It's so funny because when you have like all the characters that are so different than what they look like on the cover, right. and the colors are different, but the poses are what feel that way. And then we also have a 1 in 25 Mayhew variant that we are selling for $24.99. Well, my next one is was super fun. Uh, it was really funny. It's the um, Roxxon Presents Thor. Now, we have talked about this um, in, in a few videos before when we talk about the current Immortal Thor run. Um, this is a one-shot. 
It's not leading anything big. It's just one single book, one and done. But just to give you a quick recap, in the pages of Immortal Thor, uh, Dario Agar, who is the Minotaur, who is a big Thor villain, he is the CEO of Roxxon. Uh, Roxxon bought the Marvel Comics that exists inside our Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. Um, and he changed it from Marvel Comics to Roxxon Comics, and uh, in an effort to um, weaken Thor, basically, Roxxon Comics created this actual book inside the Marvel Universe, inside the books we're reading. Um, so you take this book, you sprinkle it with a little bit of magic from the Enchantress, couple million people read it and it changes their it, it instead of thinking oh thor is the thunder god and he's this big powerful warrior this issue makes thor kind of look like a big buffoon <laughs> and when the people inside the marvel universe read this comic and it's all very meta i know it's already sounding kind of confusing but when they read this book and like i said with a little bit of magic sprinkled in um their perception of thor changes and it weakens him thus allowing uh, the Minotaur to beat him, although we haven't got there yet. So this is the book that he cre that the Minotaur created inside the pages of Immortal Thor. We're actually getting to read the story that he created. So that was a really confusing, I know, but um, it's really funny. And I kind of think of this as capitalism, the comic book, yeah. right? Um, the um, uh, like I said, Thor's a big buffoon to this whole book. It's very corporate. There are so many mentions of various Roxxon products inside this book. For an example, there's something that even Heimdall with his great vision can't see. He can't figure out something. And uh, so he says, well, my great eyes can't see, but maybe, Thor, you should turn to something even more powerful than me. That would be the Roxxon Eliza, the AI assistant on your Roxxon phone. <laughs> and, and Thor like... Hey, Eliza, blah, blah, blah. And it tell, gives him the answer. He drives a Thor truck, which he has no doors or keys. He has to use his rocks on phone, which then gives him a code that he then has to enter into a, another device, which then does something. He has to uh, launch another app and agree to the terms of serve. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And there's so many mentions of rocks on this and rocks on product that, um, <laughs> Uh, in the in this book, there are people who are protesting against Thor and Roxxon because of climate change, and and the Minotaur who looks big and buff in this, not like the weird skeleton. He's like, well, um, you know, we're we're trying to help the world. Maybe it's at the expense of global warming, but what's a what's a little bit warmer Earth? If it's in favor of a better life or something like that. And we find that, you know, Loki is lying to these people that climate change is real, even though it's like, it's like a, it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain without you having to read it. I won't go into too many details, but this is very, very funny. It's very tongue in cheek. You're not supposed to take this seriously. It's, it's hilarious. It's like I said, there's mention of some kind of rocks on product on every page. Um, every time they mention Earth Guard. There's a little asterisk, and then there's an editor's note that, that Earth Guard means Earth. <laughs> and one time they say Earth, and then with an asterisk, and they put Earth Guard <laughs> down in the middle. It's just funny. It's hilarious all the way around. I had such a good time reading this. There's even a couple of fake ads for Rocks on products in the book. So it's all very meta, like I said. It's hilarious. I recommend, even if maybe you haven't been reading Immortal Thor, maybe just pick this one up and just know that it's not a serious book and just enjoy the the, the hilarity that ensues. It's really good. It was really well done. Like you said, it must have been fun for Al Ewing to write this yeah. because he could just kind of come up with any kind of ridiculous scenario. And uh, it's really, really good. So um, even his even his hammer has rocks on, on it. His alter ego's name is Chad Hammer. Um, <laughs> even though we don't see him. I thought he was maybe going to stamp the thing and turn in like a Donald Blake, but we don't really see that. Uh, he's, he goes surfing or he goes to the beach at one point with his rocks on surfboard and it's it's fantastic. It's so much fun. Uh, I recommend it. So uh, yeah, Roxxon presents Thor. Really good. This is our uh, eighty grand off variant, which does not exude the the tone of this <laughs> book. You don't really get that kind of Thor in this. And then here's the Nick Bradshaw connecting variant, which connects with Immortal Thor number nine, which was the lead into this issue. Uh, and it's very. It's just I had a blast reading this. Yeah, I I want to. Even though I'm not caught up on Thor, I want to read that yeah. issue just. 
because it just sounds fun. Yeah, if you just know the crux of the story, it's just kind of meta, and you know, this is the book that they created in the pages of Immortal Thor, and now we get to read it. That's all you really need to know. And then just enjoy the ride. Yeah. Okay, so next up, I have a book I've really been enjoying. I'm glad issue two was as good as issue number one. This is Helen of Windhorn from uh, Tom King and Bill Quist Evely. So this is... uh, The setup, in short, is there's a girl, Helen. Her father was kind of a Robert E. Howard-type writer. He wrote these adventure stories about a barbarian... Uh, she traveled around with her dad. They never quite had like a, a, a home. Uh, they just went on crazy adventures together and, you know, she kind of got in trouble, but it's because he was so, such a like fun, crazy guy. He dies and she's not old enough to be by herself. I guess this takes place in like the twenties or thirties, okay. something like that. Um, so she moves in with her grandfather and she has kind of this, uh, a maid or a, a helper, a, a caregiver that kind of has to watch out for her until she turns 18. But she realizes her grandfather has this giant manor that her father grew up in but never told her about it, and she kind of wonders why this happened. Well, in the last issue, she saw a creature in on the grounds of the house that very, uh, from the pages of her father's books, mm. what is all this about? And I like this because I feel like in so many books, someone would see something like that and be like, oh, golly, I this is adventure. I need to get mm. out there. This, like, traumatizes Helen. She sees this thing, and the problem is her, uh, her caregiver saw it as well, but she's such, like, a practical lady that, like, She does not entertain any fantasy ideas. She's like, I'm sure this is a country we haven't been in before. They have their own kind of animals here. That was just, yeah, it was a little weird, but it was something. And her grandfather who lives here is a very weird um, kind of eclectic man who, uh, when he eats his dinner, he just like scarfs it down Mm. in a very like savage way and doesn't really pay Helen much mind. Uh, so Helen is a heavy drinker in this, <laughs> and instead of getting worse, this actually gets better because she just stays up all night, like looking out her window and worrying about what's going on. And so she, in this issue, is really trying to make sense of of what she saw. And even though her caregiver at first is like in denial and doesn't want to tell her anything, she starts to feel bad for her that like. This is really messing with Helen. Maybe we should go to your grandfather and ask him about, hey, is there anything going on here? It's not clear if the caregiver maybe does know a little bit more, but she does confront him at one point. The grandfather is like, you need to explain something to her. And he's like, nope, not doing anything. But maybe that all changes in this issue. And maybe he has a turn of heart and some stuff may be revealed to Helen that will explain more about her family's lineage, Mm, who her father was, and all this. It's really cool. It feels like this could have easily been a novel, like a a, a very good novel, Mm -hmm. but I love that it's in comic form because it's just rich. Yeah. The the art is rich, the the story. It just feels like back when I used to read, when Fables was at Vertigo, uh, that level of just like, wow, this is something, you know, bigger than just, you know, there's not a whole lot of action in this, but it's just really interesting. It's a good story, yeah. Good story. So if you're into that kind of thing, maybe you want something different from this, the the superheroes, all that, I can't recommend this enough. It's such an interesting uh, world they set up that feels classic but new. So, yeah, highly recommend Helen of Windhorn, and I can't wait to get the next one of this. And we've got some, uh, I think we've got two variants for this. First off, we have the Evely variant, but this is the foil variant where just the title is foil. And we have a 1 in, twi- one in 10 uh, small wood variant that we're selling for $10. Well, next I've got Giant Size Hulk. This is the next of the Giant Size books that we've gotten a few of this year. We're going to get a few more. Um, this one... Um, it's a first appearance of a villain named Patchwork Jack, and I think that's such a cool name. 
Um, I will say that this kind of sort of does tie into the current Hulk storyline, maybe a little bit more than the other giant size books have tied into their respective books. Uh, and I'm not caught up on the current Hulk run. So I was a tiny little bit confused as to one aspect of the story, but it's, I was still able to enjoy this. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, in this one banner is train hopping. Like, you know, he basically, you know, hiding on a, in a train car, just trying to get to the next town. Kind of like a vagabond, I guess. But there's some other kids on that train car that are doing the same thing that he is, but they're not. he's not with them. They're just over there doing it, and he's in the corner just trying to keep to himself. Um, well, this new villain named Patchwork Jack pops up, and I don't know if he maybe he kind of rides the rails or whatever, but he's this demonic-looking being. Uh, seems like he's got some kind of demonic powers. I'm not quite sure if that's accurate, but... He um, approaches Bruce about paying his toll for riding the train, and he points at the girl that's uh, a girl that's with the kids that are over there. He says, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna take her eyes mm. as her payment for riding the train." And then that doesn't sound super great to Bruce. You know, he says, "Leave her alone, leave me alone." Of course, Patchwork Jack doesn't. And then it's a Hulk book, so you can only imagine what happens next. And then the whole thing, the rest of the main story, just becomes basically a big slugfest, as any good Hulk should be, between Hulk and Patchwork Jack. Of course, Patchwork Jack's not this big hulking guy, but he's sort of this demonic entity, so it's not just, Hulk just can't just flatten him and that's it. But the whole rest of it is a, is a battle between Hulk and this new villain on a moving train, and it was really fun. I like the artwork. It's like really action packed. It's, it's what I want from a Hulk book, and I liked it a lot. And then this also has a reprint of Hulk number 372. So that's from back in the 90s, written by Peter David with art by Del Kion. Uh, and that one featured uh, a train, or at least part of part of the story featured a train as well. I don't know if that's why they put it in. But it's a really solid Hulk book that you don't, it's a one and done. This story is one and done. You don't really need to know, uh, you know, be reading the current Hulk series to understand this. Um, if you just want a good one and done Hulk story, then yeah, pick this one up. I, I liked it quite a bit. So uh, we have our A cover right there. Got a couple of variants. This is the Deadly Foes variant, featuring many of Hulk's foes right here. Uh, we've got this really nice Chris Allen Stormbreakers variant, which um, I'm not really sure that's supposed to be. I don't know if that's like some variation of the Hulk or not. And then we have this nice uh, 1 in 25 Asrar variant that we're selling for $40. You can see Hulk on a on a train. Maybe this kind of sort of is what the inside looks like. Uh, you know, the trains exploding and everything, but really fun. Hulk's on a train. Yep. It's the new Samuel L. Jackson. I'm movie. tired of this. Yeah. I'm tired of this. Whatever, whatever Hulk on this, whatever train. You could only fit a couple though. Right. Yeah, it's true. Not, not too many Hulks on that plane. Okay. So next up, I've got one up back here. This is Penthouse Comics. Number two, big magazine size continuation of this very cool new anthology style uh, story, like what we said with the first one, everyone goes into this who has their own idea of yeah. what's going to be inside. But actually, you get uh, the first issue had four stories. This one you have five stories. Uh, they added a story that are really interesting. These are you know think of more of this like um, heavy metal or something right. that has very creative original stories in them that aren't all what you think they're going to be. Yeah. There's some very intricate stories in here. And I'll mostly talk about the new one in this one, which is called The Dead All Have the Same Skin by uh, Gene David Morvan. And this was really cool because it's like set in like maybe the 1930s, my 1940s, I couldn't tell. But it's about a bouncer who works at like a club. And his goal, he doesn't just like stand at the door and kick people out. He's there in case they drink too much and they get rowdy. Or if people are just there and it's time to close. He has He's the best at getting people out the door. And it's a really interesting story about uh, there becomes a fight on the second floor he has to go deal with. And maybe some personal stuff. Uh, you know, he's kind of narrating it. And what, what brought him to this job? How does it feel with his past and all that? Really cool story. Great art. I really like that one. Plus, we get part twos of I Spit on Your Grave, the adaptation of, I think it was originally a novel. They did movies of it. Uh, Miss October, which I love that one, which is like a spy thriller. Yeah. Uh, murder mystery. Uh, we've got The Dream, uh, which I believe that was the uh, Gilliam March doing the art on that one, mm. which is oh, yeah. fantastic. Uh, Gun Crazy and more. 
So really cool stuff here. Um, great original stories. And I would say most of the stories in here are like crime noir. Okay. So if that's like your speed, you'll definitely like this. Of course they're mature, but they are. They, there's really good stories behind this. So this is our A cover by Lyrix. We've got a couple others. Of course, like all these, there are two polybag covers, a little bit spicier, but they're very hard to tell which is which. So you have to look on the back and in the upper corner, there's, it's written which cover it is. Okay. And you can scan the QR code on the front. It takes you to their website and you can see which covers which. Oh, okay. So it makes it a little bit easier to tell. We have our uh, Luana Vecchio cover who did um, Heart. Oh. Uh, if you want to say it's not Heart Stopper. It's um... Love Everlasting? No, that was. No. No, no that was. The really scary one about like red rooms and stuff. Oh, I don't remember. Love sick. Love sick. Yeah, love the, the, sick the image artist. one. Yeah. Yeah. Plus we have a one in ten Suzumaka variant, which is very nice. I love they're getting some big like comic people who do variants for mainstream comics yeah. in there. We have a limited to five hundred photocopy, which is thirty nine ninety nine, and then there is another cover by. Uh, their name is Big Icky, and uh, a little too spicy for the show, but you can go on their website and check it out, or on infinityflux.net, check yeah. it out, so, uh, but really good crime noir stories, yeah, I like which crime I did noir. not expect. Yeah. Well, we've got the second issue of Black Widow and Hawkeye, the new miniseries with Black Widow and Hawkeye. Uh, in this one, Natasha questions Clint about why he says that he assassinated this Russian diplomat that everybody was after him for our last issue. But she knows that he didn't really do it. But he's claiming that he did. Why? We don't really know yet. Um, before he can answer her, though, he gets shot with a poison dart in the neck, and Black Widow pursues the, uh, pursues the shooter, but the shooter gets away. Uh, you know, a uh, cool little action scene there. And Natasha tries this risky, mes risky method to use her symbiote to get the poison out of mm. Clint. And that may have some side effects for Clint that we see next issue. So we'll have to wait and see on that. We also see the who the shooter is working for and who may be behind all of this. So uh, really cool. Um, I like the first one. I like seeing uh, Hawkeye and Black Widow together. Uh, I'm kind of I don't really love that. It seems like everybody in the Marvel universe has their own symbiote now, and I kind of feel like Black Widow is cool enough and awesome enough to not need her own symbiote. But it is pretty cool seeing her with this symbiote and how she uses it in this. So I kind of I'm gonna let this one slide. But just a, a really cool. I like the artwork. Just a fun mini series featuring uh, Hawk, Hawkeye and Black Widow. They're they're great together. So if you read the first one, you will like this one. So there's our A cover right there, and we've got some cool variants. This is the uh, Jesus Saiz variant, and I really like these. These are the um, the vampire variants. I think this one's from Carmen Carnero. And we're got a, we've got a couple more of these. Uh, we've seen a couple already. Yeah. I think we have a couple more uh, throughout the show. I just like Hawkeye and Black Widow looking like they're going to some classy golf club. Yeah, that's cool. Next up for me, I've got a couple of Star Wars books. Uh, I'm going to start off with Star Wars High Republic Adventures Saber for Hire, number one. This is by Kavan Scott and Rachel Stott. Uh, this is really cool. It's using fan favorite character Ty York who I got to work on in Tales of the Rancor yeah. Pit. So I am very partial to this character. Um, but this is really cool. So Ty York, this takes place during the what's currently going on in the High Republic with the Nile creating the occlusion zone, which is kind of a barrier that keeps growing around planets that people can't get through uh, and kind of expanding their territory. Well, Ty York is behind the occlusion zone where there's not really any Jedi, or at least not Jedi that want to poke their head out of the ground. Um, and her job is being a monster hunter for people for money. And she's having a great time because the Jedi aren't there to, you know, do this job for free. She's getting extra jobs going around, but, uh, it, it's starting to change. Her job's starting to change because people start requesting her and they say, oh, there's a monster. When she goes to investigate, it's actually the Nile, the big villains for the High Republic. And she's like, I'm a monster hunter. And then she's confronted with the idea, well, they're monsters. You know, they're they're 
what they're doing is monstrous. Why won't you take up this position? But by doing that, she's kind of stepping into the role of being a Jedi again, which she's kind of sworn away. So it's a really interesting, like, how does it play with her ideas of, you know, leaving the Jedi life behind. But, you know, when people start needing you, will you step up? Uh, really cool one there. Plus, this has the first appearance of uh, Kit Rep So, who is the son of the leader of the Republic right now, uh, Lena So. So that's really cool. He's been in the novels. And John Lauren, who has also been in the novels, and they're together in this. So it's really cool to see um, some novel characters making their first appearance in comics as well. It's the only cover I have for that one. And I also want to mention... Mesa Windu number three came out this week. We uh, learn more about uh, our new character, uh, Azita's past in this one. Plus, uh, we get more of the new bounty hunter, uh, Yaya Shram, or Shram, who is uh, he's cute and tiny, but he's also deadly. You'll see him on one of the variant covers. Plus, the first appearance of the Dusk Weavers of Haddle Path, which are kind of a new cult group that Mace is going to have to go up against and their two members Murrow and Daya uh, so really cool one there and they're really hyping up these new characters in this new uh, this new uh, cult group in the solicitation stuff so it'll be interesting to see what happens there but that is our A cover for that we have our Kamen Coley, Master and Apprentice variant. It's very dark, but with yeah. Vader and Palpatine, which is also really cool because he was the artist on a lot of Charles Soule's Darth Vader. Right? Okay. So it's cool to see him revisit those yeah. characters. And then here's uh, Yaya Shram, the dangerous bounty hunter, who's also like, I don't know, eight inches tall. That's the same as Babu Frick, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's one of these, but he's a nasty bounty mm -hmm. hunter. It's funny when Mace finally sees him and he's like, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> like, really? You're the bounty hunter chasing us? Yeah. All right, so next up is Wonder Woman number eight. We are back on the Sovereign story after a brief intermission last issue. And in this one, Wonder Woman has been kidnapped after what happened in issue number six. Wonder Woman has been kidnapped by the Sovereign. And she is tied up with his lasso of lies. So, you know, it's just it's the opposite of her lasso of truth, basically. And use, the Lasso of Lies can make, just like how the Lasso of Truth can in, make people uh, tell the truth, the Lasso of Lies can, the, the, the wielder of it can tell lies to a person and they will believe it uh, with no issues whatsoever. And then, of course, they'll, you know, do whatever from there. So the Sovereign is actually filling uh, Wonder Woman's head full of lies to make her believe that she's a very subservient wife to Steve Rogers. And it's almost kind of like... Um, Almost kind of like she's in a dream, right? Mm -hmm. She, I mean, she's she's tied up in a room, you know, with the lasso of lies. But what we see is almost like a, a dream state where she's kind of living in this idyllic, like, 1950s house with Steve. Yeah. And he goes off to work and comes home. And she's like, I'm sorry that dinner's not ready. He's like, where's my dinner, woman? You burnt the <laughs> eggs again or whatever. And it's one of those kinds of things. And it's, it's, it's really rough. Um, and she basically, you know, and that's kind of what the whole issue is, is just us seeing how she... Um, the, the lies that she's being fed, what that's doing to her, and then how or if she gets out of that and then what she does next. So just another really cool issue of Wonder Woman. I've been digging it the whole time and, and uh, you know, things are starting to come to a head. I think maybe we will see, um, you know, the end of all this Sovereign stuff pretty soon. Uh, we know that she defeats him because that's, you know, it's the, the Sovereign is still narrating the story to Trinity um, that we saw in Wonder Woman number 800. So we know at some point she beats him because we saw him in a, in a cell already. Oh, and there is a, um, there's another really fun uh, backup story with John and Damien mm. and, and Trinity um, that involves time travel and it's hilarious. So just another really good one. So uh, another great issue. There's our A cover right there. Got a couple cool variants. This is the um, uh, Totino Tedesco variant with Wonder Woman and her big gold armor. And then there's this really nice um, Villa Lobos variant as well. Next up for me, I've got Titans number 10. This is a really cool issue. Uh, we're dealing a lot with the uh, uh, Raven B 
being swapped with her evil yep. identity, kind of her more like her father, uh, but still playing it, you know, cool, but doing some pretty dark manipulating in, within the Titans. But most of this is about Raven's brother, Trilogy. It's funny, you have Trinity. Yeah. There's also Trilogy, who is a demon. And he gets manipulated by Trigon to go and he's like, or one of Trigon's people is like, oh, you know, Raven's the favorite. You should you should go and prove that you're better. But secretly, this is all orchestrated by Trigon to kind of keep Raven from going back because he still fears that she could revert back to being kind of the hero. Yeah. And he wants to, like, egg her on and, and pull out the darkness from her. So uh, this is about Trilogy going and fighting the Titans and kind of how Raven deals with it, which is pretty brutal. Um, and But Nightwing is starting to see something weird. He, he's starting to notice Raven doesn't seem right. Uh, plus, there is a, I wouldn't say a backup story, but it's definitely a change in scenery okay. at the very end. Uh, kind of an elsewhere type mm -hmm. thing. Okay. And we see uh, Dr. Tio Morrow, who we know is a great like android builder yep. and everything, uh, building something for Amanda Waller. And we see what it is, uh, but we don't have a whole lot of explanation on what it is or who it is. So I okay. have to uh, really check that out, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, just another little tie to like, oh, what's Amanda Waller doing? Yep. Leading up to some absolute power stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, very fun one there. So that's our A cover. And we also have this uh, Bayless variant with the team. All right, next is Spider-Boy, number six, one of our favorites here. It's such a fun, fun book. And in this one, um, Christina, Spider-Boy's friend, she was captured last issue. And uh, let's just say she undergoes a big change at the hands of Madame Monstrosity. Big, while, big change. Yeah, while Spider-Boy is held captive and he's powerless to stop her. Most of this issue is Christine dealing with this change that she goes through. Although Spider-Boy does eventually break free and he tries to help her and, and more to come on that. Um, but Spider-Boy also, while Christine's over here doing this, Spider-Boy receives some shocking information of his own that may completely turn his world upside down and maybe change his plans and what he was going to try to do. Um, everything's thrown into chaos, basically. His yeah, world basically is... he goes from being like superhero to like, you can do whatever you yeah, want. Right. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm backing down yeah. type thing. Yeah, so just another, you know, can't really tell you more than that without spoiling too much, so we'll stop there. But another great issue. We love Spider-Boy here. It's such a fun book, um, and uh, this one is also I feel like this fun. story also, I mean, we know the cover of the next one is kind of a, it has like Spider-Boy with all its friends he's yeah. made so far. That This Madame Monstrosity story may not have too many issues left of yeah, like maybe. Kind, of, kind of his origin story. Yeah. I feel like... Pretty soon we'll start seeing him back out on the streets. Yeah, and everything. yeah, I think so for sure. So we have this really nice uh, A cover right there. We've got a couple cool variants. This is I another like this one. one. This yeah, another of the vampire variants right there. That's super cool. Gives me kind of Bruce Tim vibes. Yeah, and then this nice Peach Momoko variant, and then this one in twenty five Bradshaw variant. I like this one, although he does not look like a kid here. No, he looks like a full grown Spider Man. But this is our 1 in 25 Bradshaw variant that we're selling for $25. Maybe that's in the future when he's he's grown up. Because he yeah. does not look like a 10-year-old right there. No. Pretty jacked 10-year-old. Yeah. Okay, next up, just wanted to mention, we have Sam and Twitch Case Files number 2. I really like this. And I'll say there's not a whole lot of Spawn-related in here, which I think actually works. These two characters have been around for so long. Yeah, they don't need since, Spawn. you know... I think Spawn issue one or Spawn issue two, yeah. something like that, um, that they really hold their own. The last issue, we had Sam who, uh, maybe his mouth is a little too big and always gets them in trouble, but they pushed the chief too far. Yeah. And huh. when he kind of freaked out on one of his informants, uh, he gets basically fired or laid off or whatever. And the chief blames Twitch too, being like, you're kind of the one who's supposed to keep Sam cool and you've been distracted. And we've always threw like 
way back in Spawn and stuff, we know that Twitch really has like a pretty good family. He's got some kids or anything. Sam is definitely like who could love this guy? He's kind of a slob and right. he's he's just not very nice. But, you know, Sam has cost Twitch his job, which is terrible. Uh, but at the last minute in the last issue, uh, Twitch, I don't remember if it's Sam or Twitch, I think it's Twitch who gets a call that an old colleague had a big case kind of out of the city where there was a, like, horrible mass murder thing that only they could come into and solve given their fresh eyes and their experience. So this one, we see kind of the fallout of them being uh, laid off from their, their detective job, what it means to Twitch's family, and then they head out on their case, which is really interesting to see, you know, how they're going to try to dust off what just happened with with everything and investigate this new thing and meet up with these uh with his old colleague and it's like Sam and Twitch go country. <laughs> like they go definitely not. It's not the city. It's very rural. Uh, so it just makes it interesting to see these two street yeah. uh, city cops deal with something out there. So I think this continues to be really fun. You know, if you've never read a spawn book, I think you could still read this because so far they have not, there hasn't been any like overtly supernatural things happening in okay. it. So I think it's really cool. So uh, I really like Sam and Twitch Case Files number two, and we have this variant by uh, Kolak. Well, next I've got Nightwing number one hundred and thirteen or Legacy number three hundred. Uh, was pretty big landmark issue. This one's written by Tom Taylor and also Marv Wolfman of uh, you know Teen Titans fame and all kinds of stuff. I shouldn't just of put history of comics. Yeah, I, I, I can't just put one one title on his name. Uh, and the art is by uh, Daniel D. Nicuolo. There's also a a silent backup story written by Michael Conrad and uh, the artist by Howard Porter. I mean silent as in there's no word balloons. It's all just uh, it's all just uh, I images. To it, I couldn't hear a thing. Yeah, it was, it was d totally quiet. <laughs> um, so part of the main story here in this issue uh, sets up what is to come in the next story arc with Heartless, and we know that uh, it, that that story arc starts in the next issue. And that is going to be Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo's last run on Nightwing. So I'm super sad about that. So part of this sets up that. Um, the other part of this revolves around a very special day for Dick. Um, every member of the Bat family is going to um, be there to celebrate this day with him. And it's something very good uh, for him that he deserves. Uh, and there's part of this story that honestly, like it, it, it got me a little bit. Like it choked me up just a little bit. I, I showed you the the, mm -hmm. the part, and like I wasn't expecting it. And I read it, and I, you know, you can feel it in your eyes. Like your eyes get a little bit like starting to water. I was like, oh, that I wasn't prepared for that. That really kind of got me a little bit. So a wonderful story. Uh, some art. Some some really great art. There's a like, good action, but also some good emotional moments as well. A great great uh, legacy issue for Nightwing. Uh, before we start his next uh, story arc. So just wanted to put some love out there for this one. So this is our A cover by Bruno Redondo and just all kinds of cool uh, motion there. We've got some really cool variants. So this is the Dan yeah. Moore variant. This is the one that I pre-ordered. I love that. That was my phone uh, wallpaper for a while. Love that one. We have this really nice uh, Jamal Campbell featuring um, a bunch of different incarnations of Nightwing there. Sometimes all the Nightwings Voltron up. Right. <laughs> giant Nightwing. Uh, this is the Jim Lee um, uh, Art of Spotlight, Art of Spotlight yeah. variant. Looks really good right there. <laughs> I love this one, the Serge Acuna variant. Oh, that is Serge Acuna, right? Let me double check. I don't want to make sure. Yeah, Serge Acuna in the disco outfit. Love that I one. I used to hang out with Dazzler. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then there is the 1 in 25 Redondo Virgin variant that we're selling for twenty dollars. Very cool. My last one this week is Fall of the House of X number four. So this is interesting because we know now about a lot of the titles coming up for the new From the Ashes X Men book, yeah. and all of that. Uh, but it's interesting to see how we're getting there and kind of uh, you know we don't get a whole lot of hints to it, but just the way characters are in this, especially Xavier, is really. Like, we didn't see Xavier in any of the images from the new stuff. That's true. And I don't know. He's, he's, I don't know. 
Xavier, he's got a lot of explaining to yeah. do from this one. Some great Cyclops moments in this, but it's all just rushing towards a head with the big finale of the Fall of the House of X that I'm very excited about. But not a great issue if you haven't been reading them. <laughs> You'll be pretty uh, not a, Not a good jumping on point. I just want to let you know the next installment of that is out this week. Plus, we got some great variants. We've got this uh, just variant with Emma Frost. And we've got this 1 in 25 Asrar variant that we're selling for $25 with Polaris. Well, next I've got Batman Superman World's Finest number 26. This issue was just bonkers in the best way possible. So much fun. Lots of good action. Everything about it is great. There are um, mite versions, you know, these fifth dimensional imps. There's a lot of different mite versions of various supervillains that are causing chaos around the globe by powering up their supervillain counterpart. So we see a might version of Sinestro mm -hmm. who powers up Sinestro's ring. And there's a couple other villains like that. Uh, Batman and Robin and Mr. Mix's Pitalik. They head off in one direction to go deal with it while Superman and Bat, Bat might go off in another direction to try to divide and conquer. We do learn who may be behind all of these new might villains because uh, they I don't think they've been around before. A um, lot of lot of fun in this. A lot of great artwork by Dan Mora. There's some two really cool uh, versions of characters uh, that we've never seen before. Uh, I will say that Key Collector says that this is the possible first appearance of Doom Might, which is a cross between Doomsday and Mr. Mixes Pitalik. Uh, and that's not true. There is no Doom Might in this whatsoever, so don't listen to them. But um, just a really fun story. Uh, it like, and it's not super over the top goofy like a like you might think a book full of fifth dimensional imps might be. Um, there is some comedy and some silliness to it, but there's also like this is kind of serious though because these mm. villains are super powered and Superman, Batman, and Robin are having a tough time dealing with them. So everything about it is wonderful. Continue to love World's Finest, and we just wanted to let you know about this great issue. Uh, and this story is going to last for this, like, this is the next story arc, so this is going to last for a few issues. So, awesome A cover right there. We also have this really nice um, uh, La Roca and Sotomayor variant right there. We've got this super cool foil, just the, the Batman Superman logo. Like from the old series, yeah. Superman Batman. And you can't even really see it, but it is foil, so that's really cool. Uh, there's a 1 in 25... Um, uh, uh, Pagulin variant that we're selling for $15. And then we have this 1 in 25 Gaylord variant that we're selling for $20. It's got all, all the hits on yeah, it. Yeah, that's a... Even Marilyn Moonlight. Yeah, I like the style on that one too. You got any more? No. Oh, well, okay, just <laughs> super quick because we don't really have much more time. I just wanted to let you know about Avengers Twilight number 5 is out this week. This is the next to last issue of this mini series. Uh, I can't really say anything about it without spoiling everything because it is near the end of the story. So I, I won't say anything just for fear of spoilers, but just wanted to let you know that it is out this week. If you've been reading it, uh, don't miss it. It's very good, though. So don't miss that for sure. And we've got this uh, really nice Daniel Acuna variant for that as well. I like the Avengers Twilight versions of characters. Yeah. Like and Avengers the, Twilight Hawkeye is cool. Yeah, and this one, this nice uh, Dark Knight Returns <laughs> homage variant featuring Hawkeye. That one is by Ben Sue. That one is super cool as well. And there's one super quick last thing. We just wanted to let you know about this uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths number one facsimile edition in foil that is out this week as well. There's a non-foil version as well. But still, in my opinion, the biggest and best uh, comic book event there's ever been because it actually did what it said it was going to do and changed the, uh, change the DC Universe forever. And uh, this is the start of what I'm assuming will be 12 facsimile editions over the next 12 months. And it looks super good in foil, too. Yeah, so if you want to get it, get it because, you know, you're going to be issue 6 or issue 8 and be like, oh, I wish I got that. Yeah. Go ahead and get it. Especially, I'm going to get them all in foil just yep. to make it that much different. Yep, same. Uh, but also, I'm just looking forward to I want to reread it again and kind of, you know, in the space that it takes to read when they come out. Uh, I have, like, a hardcover of it and everything, but it's still such a pivotal moment in comics. They can really set the stage for event books. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, definitely don't miss out on that one. And that is it for our early comics review video. Thank you so much for watching. Head over to infinityflux.net right now where you can purchase any of these books while supplies last, especially on those incentive variants and all that kind of stuff because 
you know, we've only got a couple of each, so head over there right now, get your orders in as early as possible. Stay tuned for our video coming up on Wednesday. We'll be going over the books that you can pre-order by the weekend, so that's really awesome. Uh, make sure to give us a subscribe if this is something you are interested in, if you like talking about comics, if you like comic news and hearing about the new stuff coming out, we are the place for that. We're so close to 3,000 subscribers. Yes. Uh, we would love to have your your sub subscription there. Your, your subscriber. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so give us, a, give us a subscribe, give us a like, uh, and then leave an emoji of... Leave a brain, because oh, we've got House Brainiac. of Brainiac this yeah. week. So leave a big old brain to let, to let us know that uh, you made it through the episode with Yes, us. absolutely. So thank you so much for watching, and until next time, see, see ya. ya.